I have one verse of scripture. I'm reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, and verse number 1. To everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. To everything, there is a season. And then there is a time to every purpose under the heaven. Seasons and times. Things and purposes. My subject this morning, in the process of time. So, Father, thank you today for speaking to me. Thank you for giving me a word. I understand your order. And because you've called me to pastor this local flock, you speak to me words. You give me creative words to help us. And that word blesses others. If any good comes from it, it is because it originated with you. May you use me, speak through me, open the hearts of every hearer who hears this word. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. Would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? You may be seated. Time is the most precious commodity we have. It is non-redeemable. Once used, it can never be recycled. It can never be reused or unused. I've often noted that the word time spelled backwards is emit. And the word emit means to give or send out matter or energy. It means to issue with authority, especially to put into circulation, to emit. When I look back in time, when we look back in time, what matter, what message will our life send out? Several years ago, the newspaper told how a Navy jet fighter shot itself down. That's right, you heard me correct. A Navy jet fighter shot itself down. And I know you're thinking, how is that possible? Not only is it not impossible, it really happened, and it happens to more than just jet fighters. It happens to real people. Flying at supersonic speeds, the jet fighter ran into the cannon shells that it had fired only seconds before. The jet was traveling too fast. Now, before you start to point fingers of judgment at me, I know who I'm preaching to. If I had a jet... I'd already shot myself down a few times. If there is one word that does more damage to the body of Christ than any other, I would submit that word very well may be hurry. Hurry. Do you know what the law of the harvest is? The law of the harvest is nothing more than an agricultural allegory describing the process of time. Paul said, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. When do you reap in the process of time? If you sow, you will reap. When you reap, how you reap are unknowns. That you reap is a certainty. And it occurs in the process of time. Solomon said to everything, there is a season. A season is a process of time. A season requires patience. Summer isn't a day. Excuse me, summer doesn't arrive in a day. Summer is a process of time that arrives over a process of time. My late pastor, Reverend T.F. Tenney, would often say, We are a microwave generation serving a crockpot God. (laughs) 
Boy. Brother Tenney was creatively stating that God is a God that uses the process of time. Of all the miracles that Christ performed, he never once turned an infant into an adult. Even his birth, he refused to come to earth as a mature, fully developed man. He came the natural way through a supernatural process. He was conceived in the womb of a woman through the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost. Christ was conceived. Christ first came to earth as a fertilized egg in the womb of a virgin. He spent nine months gestating, developing, growing inside a human body, just like all other humans. Jesus Christ was born in the process of time. Genesis 4 and 4, excuse me, Galatians 4 and 4 says, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. The fullness of time. Time is God's gift to humanity. It's a gift. If you have time right now, you have a great gift. If you're young, you think you're going to live forever. If you're 50, not so much. You start waking up and you begin to recognize your mortality. Just one more day, God. One more year, God. Just a little more time. Time is God's gift to humanity. With it, we have the greatest opportunity to use it to fulfill his will and thus become one with him, to ultimately be reunited with our creator in eternity where there is the absence of time and the absence of pain and the absence of suffering and the absence of addiction and the absence of disappointment and the absence of dysfunction. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to read to you. Do not allow these familiar words to have no effect on you other than to jar your memory of fairy tale hopes of unfulfilled dreams. Listen to the anointed words of God's stethoscope, the one who laid his head on the bosom of Christ, the one who referred to himself as the disciple whom the Lord loved. John felt that he was a little more special to Christ than the others. Maybe he was. It was John that was given divine revelations. He even wrote a book with that name. Listen to what this man had to say about what comes after death. Are you hearing, Pastor? Listen to what the man said who had divine revelation from God about what to expect when you die. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You will have eyes in heaven. You will see in heaven. You will have vision in heaven. You will have an optical nerve. You'll be able to perceive in heaven. You are not some glum of mass, some vapor floating around, some person with a white robe stroping a, a, a golden harp on a cloud. No, 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 no. You will have eyes, and the Bible says those eyes will have no tears. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. I'm talking to you about the process of time. There's coming a day when you're not going to be disappointed. There's coming a day when there's going to be no debt, no disease, no death, no dysfunction, no divorce, no disappointments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, heaven is real. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
and you can feel it. You can attempt to deny it all you want, but it's in there. It's in there. I've had them come to church tell me they don't believe God. Then what you doing here? I've had them come to church tell me they don't believe in the name of Jesus. I said, did you see the sign when you walked in? This is the Jesus Worship Center. Your belief in him doesn't change his existence. Your faith in him doesn't change his existence. He is God Almighty. He is God made flesh. He is the perfect one. He's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending. No crying, no sorrow, no death, no more pain. That means there's no more ibuprofen, no more BC powder, no more aspirin, no more buffering, no more Tylenol. If forgiveness is real, then this is real. If mercy is real, then this is real. If God is real, then what he just said is real. This is not too good to be true. It's too God to be false. He has prepared a place, and he has declared the end from the beginning. We have not believed fables, but fabulous truths that will produce a harvest in us in the process of time. I've got hundreds of pages of notes from T.F. Tenney. Brother Tenney said this many years ago, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Have you ever been in a place where you couldn't trace his hand? Okay, God. Really? Yep. Do you not know I'm broke? Did you not look at my checking account before you allowed my air conditioner to go out? Oh, I know you got all power. You could have prevented it, but you didn't. Have you ever felt like, you may not have said it, but you felt it. You kind of did this. Of course, you caught yourself and you repented. I love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Come on. And under your breath, you're going, you know, if I was God, I wouldn't do that to my boy. I'd take care of him. I'd be protecting him. I'd be blessing him. I'm just saying, you know. That's why you're you and I'm me, he would say. Can't trace his hand. I'm going to trust his heart. I do believe Jeremiah 32 and 40. It is written in my house. It is all over my heart. Jeremiah 32 and 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. I often say it, I've preached it a thousand different ways. He's never going to stop doing good to me when bad happens. That didn't mean good stopped. It just means good is on its way because he's never going to stop doing good to me. I don't care how much bad, how much evil, how much disease, how much sickness, how much disappointment occurs. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's his heart. That's his heart. I may not be able to trace his hand. I can't see the hand of God in this, but I trust his heart. The finger of God will never point where the hand of God will not provide. You don't have to know how when you know who. Because the how is hidden in the who. Who is spelled W-H-O. How is the rearrangement of those letters. You take the W and put it at the end, and who becomes how. How becomes who. The who is hidden in the how. Once you know who, you don't have to know how, because the how is hidden in the who. How can this be made? Who are you talking to? How can this person come out of the grave after being dead four days? I'll tell you how. There's a who saying, Lazarus, come forth. When you've got the who, you don't have to know the how. You have the who. You have the who. Yes. What he told you, he meant when he said it. Paul said, for all the promises of God in him are yea and, and, and him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. They are yea and amen. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. 
He doesn't say something and say, oops, I take it back. I got to trust the God of process. I got to trust the process of time. It's God's gift to humanity. Oh, I know you want it fixed right now. I know you want your marriage fixed immediately. Microwave generation, crockpot God. Crockpot, you know the best food takes a long time to prepare. If I show up at your house and you're going to whip something up for me, it'll be okay. But it won't be like something you've been preparing for a week to make. Big difference. You begin preparing and putting stuff up and marinating and all kind of stuff. When I'm eating that, man, pastor, it's been aging. This isn't just any ribeye. This is an eight. Well, oh, well, 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 well. You go to, you go to the, the uh, whatever it's called in Lafayette. Come on, brain. Grocery store. Let me talk, okay, Rouse's. You knew better than to say something. Go to Rouse's and they got ribeyes and they got aged ribeyes. And so the, the ribeyes are, you know, 15 bucks a pound or something ignorant like that. Then the aged ribeyes are like $20. Why? Because something about time, something about something that's been aged over time. I don't drink alcohol, but I know enough about alcohol to know that a wine that's freshly made today isn't a good wine. The best wine is aged wine. Something about the process of time that improves some things. So you say you want God's best. It's in the process of time. Trust the process of time. It's God's gift to humanity. Time is a gift from God given to us to determine where we wish to spend eternity. I set before you two options for eternity, smoking and non-smoking. Choose non-smoking. I've had people ask me this, so wait a minute, Pastor. Let me ask you a question. If a person goes to hell, I've heard that somebody can do something to get you out of hell. The answer is no, sir. No, ma'am. The Bible says, is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. Once you die, your eternal destination is set. You have time now. This is the day. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to get right with God. Nothing anybody can do for you once you're on the other side. The Bible says there is no knowledge in the grave where thou goest. Your issue isn't with me, it's with the word of God. Look what the book says. You have this precious commodity called time. Eternity comes out of time. The process of time points to the product of eternity. The children, the immature... They cannot and will not understand this. The carnal mind does not trust in the God of process. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. Growth is the result of the process of time. So if you just drove by here and you see this building in this congregation, you're thinking, Whoo, man, look at that dude. He got it made. If you knew the pain of the process of time. But in the process, I knew that we were making progress because the God of that process kept saying yes to many prayers and to many petitions. It's a process. You're in process this morning. You're in the process. You're in the process of time. Don't get out. God is a process God. Our prayers are often a request for God to violate his own laws, to circumvent kingdom principles for our, in, for our empire-building egos. We want it now. Her name is Julie Dawn Cole. You may not recognize her now, but, oh, you know her. And you've seen her. Yes, you have. When you see the next image, you will remember the visceral sound of her whiny voice. Her irritating menagerie of crybaby words demanding her way. You know her as a spoiled brat 
Veruca Salt from the original movie, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. I want it now! I want it now! She wanted the golden goose to produce the golden eggs. All right, Willy Wonka, how much you want for the egg? How much you want for the goose? It's not for sale, but I want it now! She sings a song, I want it now. I don't care how, I want it now. And people who want it now don't care how because they don't know the who. He is the God of the harvest. He knows what's best. That's why you didn't find her till this season in your life. That's why, you could, that's why God didn't give you all that. That's why you didn't win the lottery. You shouldn't be gambling anyway. He, he knows. Believe me. He knows what's best. He knows what's best. In a recent interview, she said, I was only 12 years old when I left the U.K. and moved to Germany for three months in 1970 to film my part as Veruca Salt in Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. As the only child actor who was not accompanied by a relative, I was quite homesick. I'd never have allowed my own children to have gone off alone like that. But the wonderful cast and crew took care of me and my family were amazed at all the kindness I received from Gene Wilder and the rest of the studio. In a tweet, this woman who played Veruca Salt, when Gene Wilder died in the last couple of years, she sent this tweet out. And this was a quote from Gene Wilder. He said, time is a precious thing. Never waste it. Amen. It's so easy to get in a hurry, to rush, to run hither and yon, to constantly be on the move and never slow down. An appropriate description of our day. This is the age of the half-read page, the quick hash and the mad dash. The bright night with the nerves tight. The plane hop with the brief stop. The lamp tan in a short span. The brain strain and the heart pain. The cat naps until the spring snaps and all the fun's gone. So much to do, so many places to go, so many people to meet. Realize this. God made you and I finite beings capable of being in only one place at a time are you here with me today Amen. or are you right now already in Monday Amen. are you here with me here now or am I just looking at a shell are you a zombie but your brain is somewhere else are you just an animated corpse to, who somehow got up and said they are going to say you come and you sit down, and when everybody else stands up, you stand. You still don't even hear. People start clapping. Oh, you start clapping. Hands are going up in the air. Yeah, yeah. If I say something ignorant, like how many of you want to go to hell? Your hand goes up. Oh, whoa, whoa, no, 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 I don't want to. You finally wake up. Why are you in Monday when it's Sunday? Why are you in the retirement years when you still got five years to go? You need to be right here, right now. You are a finite being. You and I will never get around to all the things we wish to do, to see, to be. We can, however, trust his very precious gift, the process of time. With time, we can grow. With time, we can mature. And with time, we can overcome. So stop being so hard on yourself because you're still addicted to nicotine. Look at pastor. I want you delivered from that nicotine. I do. But he loves you while you're addicted. Listen to me. You're struggling with pornography. You're struggling with alcohol. You're struggling with pills and prescription medication. I want you delivered from all of that too, like he does. But while you are in process, his love for you hasn't diminished one iota. He loves you with an everlasting love. Hang in there. You're in the process of time. But pastor, I still want it. So? I still want some things I shouldn't have. Does that make me evil, wicked? It makes me a human being Amen. that I'm never getting escape until I cross over. Until. 
He is the supreme being who created all things, but he reserved his crowning achievement for his last, his own facsimile, man. Here is a terse verse that we all should rehearse. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also has set eternity in the hearts of Of men. It's in there. It's in there. You know there's more to life than life itself. You can feel it. You can sense it. Can't put your finger on it maybe, but you know it's there. You may consider yourself a backslider. You may consider yourself backslidden. You may consider yourself carnal and cold. I don't know what you think you are, but I will tell you this. Eternity is inside of you. No matter how you try to deny God's existence, no matter what you can point to as the evidence of his non-existence or he doesn't care, he has set eternity in the hearts of men. The NIV says he has made everything beautiful in its time. Each thing has It's time. The thing you've been praying for, the thing you've been hoping for, that thing has its time. Don't assist the caterpillar through his metamorphosis. You see a caterpillar struggling to break through that shell, and I can can see the word C-H-R-Y-S something else, Chrysalis, I'll come up with the words, okay? One day y'all are going to learn. He's struggling to break through the chrysalis. He's, and if you see him, you're thinking, oh, poor, poor butterfly. If, if only you know what's going to happen. It's that struggle of breaking through the chrysalis where he develops the strength, where, he de- where all the old is pulled off. It's the struggle that provides the strength. There is no strength without struggle. There is no advancement without adversity. Your problem is your promotion. There is no David without a Goliath. You want to be a man after God's own heart? Then in the process of time, you're going to meet Goliath. In the process of time, you're going to fall. And if you'll be like David and just stay in the process, just stay in the process. Trust the God of the process. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and 2, on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. Seventh day, that means there were six previous days, six days to work. Creation was the result of the process he did not just do it all in one split second the first day and the la- boom day and the night and it was the next day day and night time he denotes time the king james version takes ecclesiastes 3 and 11 and says it differently it says he hath made everything beautiful in his time so i'm just contrasting the two there was uh it's time now there's his time Now, that throws a proverbial wrench in the gears. Here's a reminder of his perspective of the process of time. Listen to this. 2 Peter 3, 8. Beloved brethren, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Awesome. If you do the math, a half an hour is approximately 21 years. So if you feel the Spirit of the Lord say, wait a minute. If some of you have issues when I ask you to wait three months, six months. If God says, wait a minute, that's 256 days. You want God to get in a hurry? When you hear the Spirit of the Lord say, just one second. When you hear the Spirit of God say, just one second, He said, that's four days and seven hours. Just one second. I'll be there in a second. If you can hold your breath for four days and seven hours, you'll meet him. (laughs) 
literally. Don't get in a hurry. Trust the God of the process. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Everything. Say everything. Come on, say everything. That's your marriage, that's your divorce. Say everything. That's the untimely death of a sibling, of a mother, of a father, of a child. Say everything. That's your diagnosis of cancer. Say everything. Everything. He makes everything beautiful in his time. I'm telling you, when you and I cross over to the other side, you'll look back and you say, oh, my God, it's beautiful. What is that? That's my life. He allowed me to see my birth and my death. I can see it all. I can see how it all kind of fit. I couldn't see it at the time when I was in the midst of it. It was horrible. It was miserable. I was sick. I was hurting. I was dying. I had cramps. I had headaches. I was in the hospital. I had died. I had I changed my diet. I had all, it was all bad. And, but now looking back, I can see it all. It's beautiful. He hath made all things beautiful. And I'm telling you what you're going through. It may be ugly right now, but one day it's going to be beautiful. It's in the process of time. Everything becomes beautiful in his time. He has a master plan, and he is the master, and he is the plan. And the master's master plan to make you beautiful, to make your life beautiful, is in his time. Slow down. Take a breath. You're in the process. The little kids used to sing the song, and I'm a terrible singer. <clears throat> He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and faithful he must be. He's still working on me. There really ought to be a sign up on my heart. Don't judge me yet. There's an, there's an unfinished part. But I'll be better just according to his plan, fashioned by the master's loving hand. He's still working on you. Don't you accept people's label? Don't accept their judgment of you. Don't accept what people said about you. Don't wear their label. He's still working on you. Hey, 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 reserve judgment. I'm in the process. I'm in the process. I'm in the process of time. Jeremiah 18 and 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is the word that came from the Lord to Jeremiah. He said, arise and go down. That's kind of funny. You got to get up to go down. Where am I going? To the potter's house. This ain't about Brother Jake's. Just hang with me. You get up so you can go down. Have you ever felt like that? God called you out of darkness, got you up. You didn't even know there was a hell until you started living for God. Your marriage was great until you tried to serve the Lord. Your money was doing fine until you came to church. You had to get up to go down. Arise, go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. He said, Jeremiah, I'm going to speak to you from an illustration of the process of time. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. It was the potter's house. One potter. And that one potter brought a work on the wheels so this potter have extension cords plugging in multiple wheels how what kept those wheels spinning let me explain this to you there was no electricity available to plug in any type of generator or motor because there was no motor the wheels referred to the two wheels that every potter had there was a wheel that you could see that he would put the clay on. And then there was a wheel that you could not see. It was down there by his foot. Because the way the wheel got spun was because there was a potter's foot. 
the potter's wheel was spinning as a result of the potter's heel. Now, there's the work that everybody sees. They can see you spinning like you're going crazy. You don't even know what's going on. But let me tell you what's causing my wheels to spin. There's a potter whose heel is determining the speed, is determining when to stop, is determining when to pull that which mars his hand out of the clay. The, the story, the allegory of the potter's house is an illustration of the process of time. You, sir, you, ma'am, I'm talking about you and your marriage, you and your home, you and the things that God's spoken to you, the dreams, ambitions, the prophetic utterances that have come to you, they're come to pass in the process of time. I went down and I, he wrought a work, verse 4, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred. The vessel was marred. We are all marred jars. We all have defects, shortcomings, and deficiencies. There are none righteous, none holy, none good, none. The fruitless, feckless, feeble attempt to be good enough or holy enough always results in frustration and faith strangulation. Trust the potter. Remain on the wheel. Remain in his will. His will is for you to remain on the wheel and to get off the wheel is to step out of his will. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. The word marred means to inflict damage, especially disfiguring damage, to impair the soundness of perfection and integrity of. The vessel is marred, but the hand that shapes it is scarred. Isaiah 49, 16 says, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. His scars were created by our mars. Hmm. Would you come? It's in the process of time. I didn't say in the process of dime. You know what a dime is, right? Money, 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 money. Because you just knew if you had more money. If there's just one thing, Jesus, if you can just answer one prayer, make me filthy rich. Right now I'm just filthy. I just had more money wouldn't that be awesome spoke with a man recently who, who has all the money he wants and needs and more struggling with addictions struggling with all kind of life issues how can this be I thought money answered everything no it's in the process of time not the process of dime it's the process of time not the process of slime. <laughs> God uses shame and sorrow and sin to shape us. But he's not wanting you humiliated. I pray that you never come here and feel humiliated. Many people do, but I think often they feel they confuse conviction for condemnation. When God begins to prick the heart and to say, it's you. I'm talking to you. It's in the process of time. Not the process of the dime, not the process of slime. And it's not in the process of wine, W-H-I-N-E, Veruca Salt. You can wine all you want. You're still not going to get anybody drunk. Complaining, criticizing, becoming calloused. The Bible is specific about Samson's hair. It says the hair of his head began to grow again so when did Samson get his strength back in the process of time although he had an elementary education only by the time he was in his teens this man could read the Bible in six languages he later became professor of oriental languages at Fort Williams College in Calcutta and his press at Saramopur provided scriptures in over 40 languages and dialects for more than 300 million people. His name was William Carey. 
and he's the father of modern missions. You may not know much about him, but how could someone so long ago do so much? Well, his secret was that he was a plotter, P-L-O-D-D-E-R, a plotter, to plod. The word plod means to work or act perseveringly or monotonously. You just, it's the exact opposite of me. <laughs> I'm not a plotter. I'm this guy. <laughs> just always got to go. The plotter is just the steady, consistent. I will tell you this. When it comes to my Christianity, to my walk with God, I'm a plotter. I'm a God plotter. I don't do everything great, but I do some things consistently. I never fail to pray. I never fail to read his word. I never fail to go to church. I never fail to tithe and give offerings. Those things I don't struggle with. I plod. Just keep on. Difficult times. We don't have enough money to pay our bills. We can't even buy groceries this week. That's because I paid my tithes first. <laughs> this is because I didn't have money. It's just that money was already designated. And when I got paid, it went to God first. And then we tried to figure out what to do about the rest. It ain't God's fault that I was a moron with my money or that things happened. I'm just a plotter. I'm just going to keep on. I'm just going to keep on. I'm not going to stop. Spurgeon said it was by perseverance that the snail reached the ark. Don't be dazzled by the distant destination that you get on the wrong path and lose your way. It's in the process of time. A plotter's key verse is Philippians 3.13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Have you figured out that one thing yet? You're probably going to change professions more than once, but you've got to figure out that one thing you're going to do. I don't know what my one thing is. I'm going to serve Jesus Christ. No matter what else I do, I did not know I was going to be on the radio. I didn't know I was going to preach. I didn't know I was going to write. I didn't know I was going to do all those things, be motivational. All I, I did know one thing at 14. I'm going to live for God. I figured out that one thing at 14 years old. January 2nd, 1983. I'll never go tired of telling that story. I told it several times yesterday. I'm going to tell it again. His name was Wade Lorman. He was backslid in Austin, Texas, an alcoholic, a drunk. His father was a pastor, pastored in Kings Farm, Louisiana, and I think a little while in Jennings. Wade Lorman was married to Barbara. They had, I think, two, maybe three children at the time. One of them had a lot of medical issues. She was born a Siamese twin. To cope with Wade's guilt, and sin, Satan helped him find a path, and that path was, was alcohol. He had been drinking for some time. When a man by the name of Tom Fred Tenney called Kenneth Phillips, pastor of Promised Land Church in Austin, Texas, and said, you need to look up a man named Wade Lorman. Go find him. Dig him up. He's a good man. Reach him. And so Kenneth Phillips, whom you've probably never met, in 1960-something, went and found where Wade Lorman lived, talked to him, encouraged him, brought him to church, and prayed Wade Lorman back through to the Holy Ghost. Wade and Barbara began going to church in Austin. It wasn't but a few years later that Wade Lorman decided that God was calling him to a little town in South Louisiana in Jefferson Davis Parish named Jennings, located right off of Interstate 10. And so in 1970, Wade Lorman came to Jennings, Louisiana with his wife, Barbara, and his three daughters, Paula, excuse me, Johnette, Paula, and Trudy. There was one lady that was still left in the church on Florence Street. Her name was Emily. We called her Sister M. Her son is here today for the Bates. Sister M drove a, a light blue, ba baby blue Volkswagen Beetle. It was a tank. <laughs> it needed to be a tank. Because Sister M would just come to an intersection and when she felt like she waited long enough, she'd just take off. <laughs> y'all had y'all's turn? It's my turn now. 
What was the game? Was it Wahoo? What was the game y'all would play? It was Wahoo with the marbles, Trudy. Was it Wahoo with the marbles? Sister M was old ever since I met her. Wade would pastor the church in Jennings for 25 years. I became pastor January of 1995, January 1st. In 83, when I received the Holy Ghost, it was just a few weeks earlier that I began attending. And while attending church, I was still working at the fairgrounds. The, the, I was a carny for a little while. Brother Lorman came to the fairgrounds and picked me up. And in his front seat was a man by the name of Tom Fred Tenney. The same man that had called Kenneth Phillips in the late 60s and said, find Wade Lorman. Do you see how the process of time has worked in my life? You have a pastor today. I have a wife today. I have children today. Because a man of God understood the process of time. I got a big hole in my heart. I was able to be with Brother Tenney last week and pray with him. And we'd visited for about an hour. And I said, Elder, tell me what am I supposed to pray? He said, Clifton, he said, Clifton, I'd like to take one more swipe at the devil. If the Lord would allow me to have one last go around, I think I still got it in me. He's 84 years old. He's been in that rehab nursing home for five months. Going through rehab never once. Did Brother Tenney ever emit any type of negative pessimism? Always wanting to know, how's the church? Tell me what's going on. What did you preach? The first time I preached in a service where Brother Tenney heard me was in 1994. I preached a youth camp. Brother Tenney paid me the highest compliment I have ever been paid in my ministry. I preached a message titled, The Devil Has Fallen and He Can't Get Up. And when I got done, Brother Timmy said, Clifton, I want the notes of that sermon on my desk when you're done. I'm like, hey, that's my stuff. <laughs> He's been there through the process of time. Brother Timmy's last chance to go to church in his life was last Sunday. And last Sunday was his last Sunday on earth. And on his last Sunday on earth, let's stand right now. And on his last Sunday on earth, he was at the POA and they handed him a microphone. And this is what he said. And also, we are so very glad to have, so have Mr. Tiddy with us this morning. We're going to let you say a word. Greet the crowd this morning. Thank you, Pastor Chintry. They are rumbling in my soul. I hear it from the everlasting hills. The lightning of God is flashing from sky to sky. I see its illumination. There's a voice that I hear that's like none other. And it's the voice of God. The things that God has told you shall come to pass. A great I know you were here before, but the history of this church. A revival that's going to affect this city. It's going to affect this parish. It's going to affect this state. It's going to affect this nation. 
and we're going to be a part of it because it's coming to pass to the glory of God and his name is wonderful for neither is there salvation in any other there's none other name under heaven given of a men whereby we must be saved his name is his name is Jesus hallelujah why don't we all stand together and lift that name up his last words in a public setting he's still lifting up the name of Jesus he's still preaching revival he's still look we honor the memory of my pastor that DNA is in me this man understood the process of time and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you never lose your faith your faith is what will sustain you through the process of time you're in the midst of it you're in process how do you know if you're in process? Here's a good test. If you can inhale right now, you're in process. If you don't exhale, well, you just got out of the process. <laughs> if you're breathing, you're in process. Brother Tenney is done. There's not a thing more for him to do. That was his last swipe at the devil. And I guarantee you, there are thousands of congregations that are going to see that little video clip. Thousands. Don't throw in the towel. Don't judge yourself because of where you are. You are in process. Be thou encouraged in the name of the Lord. I said, be thou encouraged in the name of the Lord. Do not believe your feelings. Do not believe the news. Jesus Christ is not coming back after a weak, anemic church. He's coming back after a bride that's prepared herself. The waters of baptism are right behind me. Baptistry is heated to over 100 degrees. I got robes ready. If you believe the word of God, you ought to allow me or one of our ministry team to baptize you in the name that is above every name, the name Jesus Christ. If you allow us to call that name over you in baptism, I promise you his blood will erase every record of your sin. You will be guilty of only the sins that Jesus committed, and he committed no sins. You are spotless in Jesus' name.